It Follows is a modern-day horror masterpiece. The film's pulsing score by Disaster Piece, brilliantly murky cinematography by Mike Giolakis, and razor-sharp direction have catapulted its status from indie darling to fully-fledged cult classic. However, there's one element of the film's stark directorial vision and concise storytelling that hasn't been analyzed nearly enough in the years since its release. So today on Scream to Screen, we're going to deconstruct how It Follows changed horror forever with the 640 degree pan. But before we do that, be sure to subscribe to The Graveyard Shift and let us know in the comments which horror stories you'd like for us to cover next. David Robert Mitchell is a Michigan-born writer-director whose films include The Myth of the American Sleepover and Under the Silver Lake. As a young boy, David Robert Mitch had recurring nightmares about someone following him, seeing some unknown force slowly and consistently walking behind him no matter where he went. Sounds familiar, right? The early childhood fear of being observed and pursued by the unseen would be fully examined in Mitchell's second and inarguably most successful film, It Follows. Mitchell began writing the film in the middle of 2011 after moving out to Los Angeles, producing his first movie, and then failing to get a second feature off the ground. It follows as an elegantly simple yet elevated concept. The story follows a young girl who is given a sexually transmitted curse. This damnation takes the form of a figure slowly walking towards her. It will always be there, no matter what she does or where she goes. So, the only solution she has is to run, because if it touches her, she'll die. On the surface, the film is a parable for sexually transmitted diseases, but it's also so much more than that. It's a harrowing examination of how the decisions we make when we're younger follow us throughout our lives. It's a condemnation of timidity around sexual education, perception, and the discomfort of being observed. It's a film that strikes that rare balance of movie with a real perspective while simultaneously being absolutely horrifying. It Follows was instantly heralded upon release for its singular approach to filmmaking. The visual language of the movie is a finely honed network of simple yet effective tricks. No shot is out of place in the seething neo-horror masterpiece, and they all center around a simple age-old idea. The fear of the unseen. The movie uses two key filming techniques to build, sustain, and subvert the tension caused by the ever-present knowledge that something is coming for the characters. Those two mechanisms are the pan and the zoom. Let's examine the opening shot of the film. The story begins with a cold open. The shot follows a young woman running out of a house. She's consumed by an unholy terror, a deep primal fear of something. She flees from it into the middle of the street in a suburban cul-de-sac. She pauses, looking back at where she just came. We track with her the whole time, never looking back at what's chasing her. She appears transfixed on something just out of the camera's reach. She then runs back across the block into the house where she just exited, takes a car, and flees the scene. We've just made a near complete 360 degree turn. Technically, in cinematic language, a pan means swiveling a camera horizontally from a fixed position. This opening shot isn't locked down to a fixed point. It's actually a steady cam shot, but it sets up this visual motif. The camera is watching the victim. The camera remains in between the victim and the pursuer. The audience is unable to see what is pursuing the victim. This heightens the tension and drama. The pan is also used to de-escalate tension within the film as well. It's used as a somber yet voyeuristic tool when we are introduced to the film's protagonist, Jay. Mitchell pans and zooms across the idyllic suburban residence to set up the geography of the environment, the characters on hand, and the quiet yet still unsettling tone of the movie. The camera steady cams off of the curb and travels by the house the main character lives in, where we see Paul knocking on the front door. It then tracks along the side of the house to reveal Jay. We see her in the backyard, cleaning out an above-ground pool. The pan stops at her and then slowly zooms in. We watch her through a thicket of trees. This generates a feeling of intimacy and of us being voyeurs. The camera pushes in for an extended zoom and she climbs the ladder into the pool. 
This pan and zoom have a very different, yet still slightly sinister energy to them. This time, the visual signifier has a distinctly sensual connotation. This move is the camera manifesting the feeling that we, the audience, are literally following these teenagers and their sex lives. It's like the camera movement is signifying that we are going to enter these people's world in a very intimate way. A few shots later, we literally have a point of view shot from Jay's perspective floating in the pool, looking at the sky. Perspective is an integral visual motif in this film. Perspective is how to handle the curse, perspective on what living with something like this means, and perspective on how to accept love. This motif is immediately reinforced by Jay, saying I see you to the two young boys leering at her over the fence. They're watching her in the pool, giving an in-universe expression to the idea that this narrative is all about perception, being perceived, and the act of watching. These boys are consumed by the idea of understanding the unknown, which takes the form of human sexuality. At multiple points in the film, they taunt, leer at, and attempt to watch Jay while she's in the shower. Again, it's a story element linking back to the theme of perspective, the unknown, and sexuality. During the subsequent scene where Jay, her sister, and their friends are watching TV, one of the characters is reading off a clamshell-esque iPad that is visually reminiscent of a birth control dispenser. This establishes the idea that knowledge and sexual knowledge specifically is power. It is the unknown that is scary. And once you understand something, it is no longer unknown, and thus no longer intimidating. Not all of the film's biggest moments involve the pan, though. At about the 20 minute mark, Jay, who has just had sex with a boy named Jeff and has been drugged, kidnapped, and taken to a mysterious location, learns that she has been given this curse. She's strapped to a chair. Behind her, Jeff, with a flashlight, is explaining to her that there's a thing that's following her now. It's always going to be following her, and the only thing she can do to get rid of it is pass it on. The blocking in this scene is superb, a visual metaphor for Jay's trauma. The shot appears as though it is locked off, clearly representative of how the main character doesn't understand what is happening. She's stuck emotionally and literally. However, in a brilliant directorial reveal, Jeff grabs the back of Jay's chair and starts pushing it, showing that the camera is actually strapped to the wheelchair Jay is sitting on. This transition is visually jarring and adds to the emotional confusion of the scene. The camera being strapped to the wheelchair adds to the kineticism of the scene. It increases the tension and the fear that Jeff is going to do something to Jay. If this was the best shot in the movie, it would still be great. But it's not. Not by a long shot. We've been discussing just how David Robert Mitchell uses these techniques to build a visual language that instills unease and terror to the viewer. He mines the fear of the unseen and plays with the fear of the unknown trope through a lens of human sexuality. Well, there is one shot in particular that ties all of these story elements together. You would expect them to happen in the film's finale, but it actually happens at about 50 minutes in. Jay and her friends all travel to a nearby town searching for the boy who gave her the curse. The shot in question focuses on Jay and the next-door neighbor boy, Greg, as they walk through this school and ask to see a student yearbook. The shot in question starts with a zoom out, centering on two high school students kissing. We travel across the front exterior of this nondescript high school while Disaster Piece's pulsing score plays. We track over the front lawn and then pull out to realize we're actually inside a hallway of the high school. We continue panning tracking with Greg and Jay as they enter an office. They speak with the clerk who shows them a yearbook. The camera, however, keeps panning, forming an ominous circle. We see that there's someone across the exterior of the school coming towards us, a figure. Is it the creature? Is it just another high school student? It's impossible to tell. That's when it becomes apparent why this scene is being shot this way, because the camera keeps panning. In fact, it does almost two full rotations, nearly a 640 degree pan, constantly showing where Jay and Greg are located and where the person walking towards us is. Finally, towards the end of the pan, the camera zooms into the office. We see Jay's face tighten as she recognizes Jeff's yearbook photo and mouths, thank you for your time to the woman. Jay and Greg leave the room and head back to their car, but the feelings of tension and drama created by the pan still linger. 
it's arguably one of the most cinematic horror movie moments in the last decade. It's clear, concise, and builds off of the work that the film has established previously. The shot is almost a short story unto itself, visually speaking. It starts and ends with zooms and has a body composed of 640 degrees worth of pan. This pan is, without a doubt, the most chilling moment in the film. It's a perfect distillation of everything that has come before and will come after. In all, It Follows is a masterpiece. It's a perfectly constructed cathedral to the unknown horrors of adolescence, the trials of youth, and the fact that we all must face our own unknowns. Mitchell's direction, coupled with the pulsing score and brilliantly simple premise, is exactly what horror fans didn't know they needed. So, what do you think? Is It Follows a modern-day triumph? Will teens be scared of the film for decades to come? Is the monster's nebulous backstory the very thing that makes it so wonderfully disturbing? Will there ever be an It Follows 2? Let us know in the comments below, and don't forget, like, share, and subscribe for more videos from The Graveyard Shift.